To be alive is to ask questions. Most are simple and involve nothing more than getting through the day. Some are bigger and shape our identities. But at the heart of every human being are three questions, and these define our humanity. Why do I suffer? How should I live? And what is it all for? These questions are common to all peoples and all cultures throughout all time. They follow us through life and cannot be suppressed, ignored, or laughed away. Sooner or later, these questions confront each one of us. Our own inner being demands an answer to them. Join us this semester as we hear what the Bible has to say about life's greatest questions and how they point us to a God who brings purpose to our pain, wisdom to our ways, and meaning to the measure of our days. Okay, well, welcome back to another solid ground. I'm so glad we are past that winter storm. I thought the brothers last week did an amazing job of accommodating and um, Brian's sharing on a uh, man in the two trees and God wanting not a good man, but actually a God man was just so revelationary, so uh, inspiring. And so we're now back to another week on Job. This is actually our last week on um, the book of Job before we go on to Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And so the topic for this week, uh, you could see the title probably on your outline. It is, What is Transformation? What is Transformation? And you might wonder, why are we talking about transformation when we come to the book of Job? Well, what we want to see tonight uh, is that this week, uh, this topic, uh, is sort of the answer uh, the second part of the answer to the big question in the book of Job, which is, what is the purpose of God in our sufferings? Why do God's people suffer? Well, Alex shared several weeks ago such a good word on God's intention when we suffer is that he would work himself into us. Job, Job's experience is a step taken by God to show that God wants to remove everything natural that Job boasted in. He wanted to strip him of all of his ethics, his integrity, attainments, and all of his outward blessings so that Job would be ushered into a deeper seeking after God and then God, Job would, would gain God. And how did we see that in the book of Job? Well, at the end of Job, God comes in to appear to Job in chapter 38 verses 1 through uh, 42. He's got this dialogue. And so Job, at the end of that dialogue with God, Job responds in this way. He says, this is 42.5, he says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye has seen you. So the difference is I had heard of you, God, by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye has seen you. I've actually seen you. Therefore, I abhor myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. So what could affect this great change is that Job saw God, and that is a great thing. And as he saw God, he gained God. In the New Testament sense, to see God is to gain God. And tonight we like to add on to that statement, as we gain God, we are being transformed by God for God's purpose. So. Seeing God is for us to gain God, and gaining God ushers us into the process of transformation. Transformation uh, is a process, a metabolic process, in which a new element is added to us, and then our, our old existing element is replaced metabolically and discharged, and we're changed in form as a result of that change in our inward being. So. Transformation uh, is not a very commonly talked about subject among Christians, like regeneration is. Uh, regeneration um, is a great miracle. We know that at the outset of every Christian's life, they are uh, saved in an instant, right? It's a wonderful thing that Christ, as life, rushes into them. That's, that happens in an instant. And then, at the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, glorification. At the end of our Christian experience, uh, Christ will flood even our bodies with his divine life and nature to transfigure our mortal bodies. We'll be changed, and we know that happens also in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye. 
1 Corinthians 15 says, At the last trumpet, the dead will be raised, and we will be changed. Uh, now, regeneration and glorification happen in an instant, but transformation, you could say, is the, the long tunnel that connects these two uh, events. And so, transformation is not instant. It takes our whole life. And it doesn't uh, directly deal with our spirit, nor does it directly um, involve our body, but it's mainly God spreading in our soul. So I, I hope we can see this, uh, that transformation is a great subject, and uh, it's a little bit um, not as spoken about. And so we do need this time, and I hope it's, it's a, kind of a basic word on, on transformation for us, for our edu edification, and for us to see what God needs to do with us. So again, we saw transformation in Job. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Job was, he was proud of his, his integrity all throughout the book of Job. But at the end of Job, you see a transformed Job. He abhorred himself. He, he, that means he, he viewed himself with suspicion and hatred, distrust, no longer trusting in his own effort, but realizing, God, you are my gain. God, you are. Now, one difference I'd like to point out in the God that Job saw and in the God that we see, well, the, Job that, the God that Job saw, we could say, is the raw God or the unprocessed God. And that's why the, um, the main, uh, the main em emphasis or uh, characteristic of God that Job saw is his greatness. One of the things he said is, Job, where were you when I did this and that? Where were you? And so Job realized his insignificance. But brothers and sisters, uh, God now has gone through a long process to reach us, even condescending, taking the form of a slave, dying for us in Christ. And now we don't, we don't see the raw God. We don't see merely the God in the heavens. But what, like what Paul saw when he looked up to heaven, he saw... The, the one Son of Man, Jesus. And Jesus identified the believers on earth with himself. So we see the processed God, the approachable God, the one who's been crucified and raised for us and now lives inside of us. So this is so wonderful. Now, uh, as we come to uh, this word transformation, um, I'd like us to just look at two verses in the in the Bible. There's only two verses in the Bible that directly um, use this word transformation. The first is Romans 12.2, and the second is 2 Corinthians 3.18. So I hope that you would memorize these verses. Um, they are definitely worthy of your committing to memory. And we'll just look at them uh, briefly one by one. So Romans 12.2, it says this, <clears throat> And do not be fashioned according to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and well-pleasing and perfect. So it says, do not be fashioned according to this age. So there's an age that we're all living in, and it's fashioning everyone who lives in this age. Uh, it's conforming everyone to a certain expression. And we don't want to be fashioned according to the world's idea of what we ought to be. Instead, we need to be changed, the Bible says. It says, be changed in form. This Greek word for transformed is the word that we base our word metamorphosis on. It's a change in form, metamorphosis, a change in expression. So it says, be changed in expression. How? By the renewing of the mind, by receiving the divine element into our mind, the divine thought into our thinking. That will then affect all of our other parts of our soul. Our choices, our feelings will follow. And eventually we will not be fashioned according to this world, but will be a different form. A form that proves the will of God. It shows forth what the will of God is, which ultimately, according to this context, is to have the body of Christ. It's to have Christ in his members as a body on earth to express him. And I'd like to focus on, um, for this verse, the context right before that says, I exhort you, brothers, this is verse 1, 
through the compassions of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. Present your bodies. Uh, transformation is uh, contingent upon us showing up. We can't be uh, transformed if we're in our own place and space. The, the Lord has a fellowship that he'd like us to show up to. As our body is presented, then he takes the opportunity to transform our soul by renewing our mind, put us, put us in situations that cause us to seek the Lord, cause us to gain the Lord. Our gaining of the Lord, like we said before, it brings a new element of the Lord into us, which transforms us. So this is uh, so wonderful that we can experience this. Now, uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18 is the next verse, and that says this. Let me get to it and read it. Um, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding and reflecting like a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as from the Lord's Spirit. So we all, again, are being transformed, this time by our beholding the Lord, by our seeing the Lord, just like Job saw the Lord, and then by our reflecting the Lord to others even. So this has a, a step further that as we receive the divine, you could say shining, receive the divine infusion, something inwardly happens. It says we're being transformed into the image that we see, into the same image of the Lord. If we express that same image that we see, we're then functioning like mirrors to then behold, to then uh, reflect that image to others. So this is uh, so wonderful that we're participating in this. Uh, now in the next verse, I'd like to read it. It's the next chapter. It's 4.1, but it's really just the next verse in Paul's thought. And he says, Therefore, having this ministry, therefore having this ministry, we do not lose heart, as we have been shown mercy. So, Paul says that it is a ministry to participate in the beholding of the Lord and then the reflecting of the Lord to others. So I just, I really like this. If you've ever wondered, how do I participate in the ministry? Well, the ministry Paul's talking about in 4.1 is just this. It's just beholding the Lord and then reflecting the Lord to others like a mirror. Um, I, I feel like if we would spend the time with the Lord to and be infused with Him, then when we go into our, even into our Zoom classes, or in our, in our apartments, um, or if you have in-person classes, or anywhere for, with your family, you can then be a mirror reflecting that image of the Lord to them. Um, and people need that. I was uh, in a, I, I, you might know I have a family member, my son has a medical condition, and I was in a doctor's office on Monday, and uh, some of the parents of the other families, they have children with much more dire situations than ours. Over the weeks, we've gotten to know some of them, and this one um, mom came up to me. I've spoken to her several times in the past. She said this time, she said, um, it's not looking good. We had to put, we had to sign up for hospice care for our three-year-old son, and no parent wants to think about that. Even just recalling it, I'm moved, and I was brought to tears with her, and I just realized, what could I say at this point? And I hope I was expressing something of the Lord to her. I just said something like this. I said, you did nothing wrong. You are passing through a valley right now. I will pray for you. She said, let me have your number. I want to text you so you can get updates about us and pray for us. And I, we are all on earth to minister Christ to those around us. I hope we would participate in this ministry. And the way we do it now as college students is we spend a lot of time with the Lord to behold Him. As we do this, then we are brought into his image to express him to those around us. So now I'd like to uh, 
show you some diagrams. This is a very um, visual uh, time that we're in with everyone being on Zoom and screens. And so um, these diagrams might be instructive to you. They might help you if you're new to the topic of transformation. Um, so I've got a couple of uh, things to show you. And hopefully I can get this right in the cameras and it can look okay to you as you watch it. Now this first one I got from Jose Luis. I just loved it when I first heard it. And it's on the topic of gaining God. And so transformation begins with Job gaining God. And um, in Job 20, I'm sorry, I've got the wrong slide here. I'm going to put this one first. In Job 23.10, <clears throat> Job says this to his friends. He says, but he knows the way that I take. Should he try me, I would come forth as gold. So he says, what God is doing is taking me on a way that is like the refining of gold. It's like the fiery uh, oven that gold is brought through so that it's refined, so that you can see something valuable. Well, Job's friends, you know, they heard this. Well, they actually were speaking about this subject, and they helped him realize you know, what would the gold be? What would the gold be that Job would come forth as? Would it be his integrity or his um, self-righteousness, which he already had? Is that what he meant? Well, Job's friends helped him realize, Job, if you're to be brought forth as gold, it has to be that the Almighty is your gold. The Almighty is your gold nuggets. So in Job 22, 25, they said, Job, if you will come back to the Lord, the Almighty will be your gold nuggets to you. And so we might say, well, did they really know what they were talking about? Did, did they actually know about the divine dispensing? And I, I don't think they did, but the divine inspiration of the scriptures allows us to use this to realize for our own sake, since gold represents the divine nature, it represents God, that what we ought to do when we are brought into trials is to gain God. Should God try us? Should he lead us in a way that's like a trial to refine us. Our, by his mercy, our goal, by his mercy is, Lord, as I'm in this trial, I want to gain you. And what that, what that might look like in a diagram, I'd just like to show you. So, uh, Jose Luis drew this diagram for us, and I'd like to draw it for you, or maybe uh, adapt it a little bit, but it starts like this. As you go into a valley, he knows the way that I take. So you go into a deep valley. And then, what happens that you don't come out just the same? What happens? Well, it's that he is with you in the valley. According to Psalm 23, 20, uh, 4, David said this. He said, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I do not fear evil, for you are with me. And so what that looks like is in that suffering, in that trial, God is added to you. And then what? You come forth with more of God as your gold. So that's how we want to be when we go through trials. Otherwise, it's meaningless. Otherwise, our trials are meaningless. Everyone suffers and goes through trials. But we want in our trials to gain God as our gold so that he is added to our being. And this begins a process of transformation. Okay, so I hope that's helpful to you. Now, the next set of diagrams comes from a book uh, written 99 years ago, get this, 19, uh, 1922, uh, by a sister in the Lord named Mary McDonough. And she, she was able to summarize the whole Bible in uh, these simple diagrams. And I've got just a few of them to show you. And so she actually started with this diagram of the triune God. Now, if you were going to draw a diagram of the triune God, would it look like this? I'm not sure if my diagram would look like this, but what do we got? We have a golden circle. Now, the circle represents eternity, and of course, the gold represents the divine, incorruptible nature of God, divinity. And then, what God's intention was, she said, was to create man as a vessel. That's why this circle, the sinless Adam, is empty. It's just uh, open inside. There's nothing filling it. And of course we know man was made in three parts. So you have a 
spirit in your innermost being, then you have your soul and your body. And so God's intention, you could say, was for this gold to get into this vessel, for God to get into man, which Brian talked about when man was in front of the tree of life. But we know what happened, right? We know that before God got into man, uh, man was filled with what? With sin. And so this darkening of man's entire being unfortunately occurred. And all of us are now here uh, suffering all the things we suffer because of that fall. So man was filled with darkness, blindness, and alienated from the life of God. And now we know that Christ came. And I'm going to just get to the point where he is now the life-giving spirit in regeneration, ready to come into a person. So a diagram of a person who's just been regenerated might look like this, where the gold now has come into that person's spirit. And a little bit of Christ's life now is instantly brought inside of them. Well, what transformation looks like then in this diagram is like, is like this. So in transformation, you have the spreading of the divine life, she drew it like this, reaching to the extremity of the soul, reaching out to the boundary, almost to the body. Transformation doesn't yet affect our physical body, but it fully saturates our soul. And when the divine life of Christ, when he himself spreads in our heart, makes home fully on our heart, we, are, we have been transformed. We have a different expression. And then finally, one day, what glorification will look like in an instant is this. Isn't this so wonderful? That the divine, the divinity is now uh, expressed from within the, the tripartite man. He's fully uh, in the image of the firstborn son of God. And this is our destiny, brothers and sisters. So I hope we like these diagrams, and I hope you could even use them. Again, let me just put them in order here. If you're in regeneration, you are just, just have received the life of Christ. Now, where we are for the rest of our life is in this process of transformation. And the end result will be confirmation to the image of Christ and glorification. And so 1 John 3 says that when we see him, we will be like him. Isn't this wonderful? So this is the uh, way you can maybe represent transformation to, um, to your friends or if you're going to speak about this. Now, this next set of diagrams I'd like to briefly cover here is from nature. And we know from nature that God's characteristics can be seen and perceived. So what is this? We know what this is. This is a caterpillar. This is actually the larva stage of a monarch butterfly. So these butterflies um, and wasps and ants and bees, they all are insects that undergo what's called complete metamorphosis. That is, they're in their life cycle, they fully change their form. They're, they're one stage, they're in the larva, then they become a, a pupa, and then they have the adult stage. And so in this stage, this, this caterpillar's main job, as you can see from this diagram, is to eat. It is to consume. It is to grow. This caterpillar actually grows 2,000% in two weeks. Believe it or not, it is just eating, eating, eating. And as young Christians, I hope that would be your aspiration. Lord, I want to receive. I want to inherit. I want to eat, 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 and grow. But then, at a certain point in this caterpillar's life, something happens, and it, all of a sudden, something hardens around it, and it quiets down. And it is hidden, and it's tucked away. And maybe um, you might have been in the garden, and you might be wondering, where would all those caterpillars go? I don't see them anymore. Now, it's a cocoon. It's a chrysalis. And what there was previously so much activity, previously so much eating and growth, that's all seemingly gone. But even in this quiet stage now, this pupa stage, something, something incredible is happening. And it's receiving uh, a new expression. Uh, what was green and yellow now is receiving new colors. And new wings are growing, new legs, new ways to eat, antenna, 
the ability to soar and fly, of course, and uh, a care now is developing in it for the next generation. Something that it now is purposed to do is to reproduce. It's to produce the next generation. And so finally, it comes out of this chrysalis, and it is what? It is a beautiful monarch butterfly, soaring in the air, able to interact with the world in, in new ways, and bringing forth the next generation, the next generation. So, um, as I was considering these three stages of the larva, the pupa, and the adult, I realized that there are two characters, at least in the scriptures, whose lives somewhat follow this pattern. And those are the characters of um, Joseph and Moses in the Old Testament. And so, you just think about their lives. They also had sort of three discrete periods each in their lives. And so in the first stage of Joseph's life, he was the favorite son of the father. He had the colorful robe. He had the dreams that he would rule, that uh, others in his family would bow down to him. And he was receiving, you could say. But then at a certain point in his life, he was cast into the pit. He was sold to Egypt. And then he was put in the dungeon in Egypt. And he was, in a sense, quiet. He was forgotten. He was a memory. He was even considered dead. And so you would think, well, that was it. But in that prison, God was with him. In that dungeon, something was being operate, something was operating within him to cause him to forgive his brothers, to realize that his dreams would be fulfilled. And then at the right time, he was brought forth to the palace, and he was made the ruler over all of Egypt, the governor of Egypt, to distribute food. He was given the wisdom and the prudence to store up grain in abundance and to manage the distribution of that food throughout the famine and to preserve the life of his family in Canaan. All of, all of God's people then needed Joseph to govern and to prepare and to distribute the life supply. He was called the sustainer of life and the revealer of secrets. All of his activities in his third stage of his life were for others. It was directed toward preserving the life and preparing the way for God's people to, to continue. Similarly with, with Moses, he was in his first stage of life, he was receiving, brought up in the palace of Egypt, raised in all the wisdom and learning of the Egyptians, he was powerful in word and work, just 40 years of receiving, receiving. And then when he was 40 years old, thinking that he was ready now to be the savior of his people, he tried, but they did not approve or acknowledge him. And he then fled to the wilderness, and he was a sojourner, and he was a shepherd. He went from being the prince to being a lowly shepherd, forgotten, uh, a memory. It was like, where did that Moses go so many years, so many years ago? He's gone. And it's that time of confinement and restriction and limitation and quietness, which is the next 40 years of his life. And you would think there's nothing happening. But in that time of suffering, there's something happening. There's something being prepared in him. He comes out at the age of 80. He sees the burning bush. And he's, he's the meekest man on earth by that point. He went from being powerful to being not confident of his own speech. He's now ready to be sent by God as the apostle to rescue his people out from Egypt and lead them for 40 years in the wilderness all the way to the good land. So in that last stage of his life, he's caring for the next generation. He's, he's the, his only concern are the people that God has entrusted to him. So in both of these cases, Joseph and Moses, we see these three distinct stages of receiving a lot, of enjoying, of inheriting, of growing, of all this revelation coming. And then we see another stage of suffering, of limitation, of being forgotten, of quietness, of confinement. And then we see a third stage of, of usefulness, of ministry, of ruling, of leading, of caring for the next generation and advancing God's move on earth. So, brothers and sisters, we're not saying that 
Our life will follow three separate, distinct stages. We're not saying that from, you, from 0 to 30, you'll just receive, receive, receive. And then from 30 to 60, you'll just suffer, suffer, suffer. And then from 60 to 90, you'll just be useful, useful, useful. But we are saying that these three elements of revelation, suffering, and ministry will be present in our lives as Christians. The Lord needs us to go through these three experiences to produce us. We have to have enjoyment, learning, eating. But then we have to have suffering. We have to have confinement to cause transformation to happen so that we are changed and that we are then useful to the Lord in our new state, in our new form, just like we can see with Joseph and Moses. So these three things you can think of like a vase. You have a beautiful vase, but then you want to paint. You want to paint something on it to make it even more desirable. But then that painting needs to be baked into that vase by putting that vase and painting into an oven. Once it's in that oven, that painting, that design is baked into that vase and then the vase is ready to be used, to be useful to the owner. So we're the same way. We have a, for an early stage of enjoying, receiving, and then we have a stage of going through the baking into us of what we've seen, what we've, what we've glimpsed now becomes baked into us and then finally we're useful to the Lord. So. Students in CSOC, what I hope for you to get out of this message is that you would aspire to be in this process, to be useful to the Lord. You would go through the stages of revelation, suffering, ministry. You would go through the stages of revelation, suffering, and in that suffering, experience transformation so that we could be useful to Him in ministry. So I'd like to just pray for us now, and then we'll wrap up. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your purpose for us, that you desire to transform us into the same image as you. And we thank you that the image we're being transformed into is one who has suffered for us and been risen, been raised for us. And Lord, we expect you would bring us through the same process that you went through so that we could advance and bring forth your body in reality. Hey, we hope you've been enjoying our solid ground. And if you want more life, truth, and spirit-filled content, simply subscribe to our Seesock YouTube page right there, right there, or download the link below our Seesock app that will give you content daily and weekly in God's Word. So, we hope you can stay connected with us at Christian Students on Campus.